Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, March 21st, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Cisco released a critical security advisory regarding a vulnerability in its software cluster management protocol. The vulnerability is capable of executing code remotely and at the very least can be used for a denial of service attack. Now, Cisco became aware of this vulnerability based on the leaked CIA hacking tools, the famous WikiLeaks Vault 7 release that we've seen a couple weeks ago. There is currently no patch for this vulnerability, so Cisco just released this advisory to essentially tell their customers that there is the vulnerability, they're working on a patch. This particular cluster management protocol writes on top of Telnet. It, the exploit actually uses just some invalid talent control sequences in order to execute random code. So to protect yourself, you should just block talent access to affected devices. That's probably best practice anyway. If you're exposing your Cisco or whatever gear, not just Cisco, to Telnet, uh, you probably are playing with fire and uh, should block that as close as possible to the device. A large number of Cisco's catalyst switches are vulnerable. Please refer to Cisco's advisory for the authoritative list. And last weekend, another pwn to own competition in Vancouver went underway and probably the most impressive vulnerability being demonstrated was one that used Microsoft Edge in order to not only get access to the system Microsoft Edge was running on, but then even further in this particular case, Microsoft Edge was running inside a virtual machine. They then used a VMware workstation exploit in order to escape the virtual machine and actually break out into the host. So this would be pretty much what you would consider a secure environment with Microsoft Edge, the more modern browser, and then of course running on Windows 10 inside a virtual machine. A lot of people that analyze malware, for example, use setups like that. But the sequence of exploits being applied here was able to defeat all of these security layers. Now, Microsoft Edge wasn't the only browser that turned out to be vulnerable during the contest. There were also exploits against Safari and Firefox, amongst other pieces of software. Probably one distinction here for Firefox or Mozilla, they were able to deliver a patch for the vulnerability within a little bit less than a day. Typically, details about the exploits are not going to be released from this contest until a patch has been released by the respective vendor. And back about a month ago when Google came up with its first SHA-1 collision, one of the software systems that always was brought up as one of the issues with SHA-1 was Git. Git uses SHA-1 hashes quite extensively in order to label essentially commits. Now, there's some discussion whether that's actually a security function or not, or whether it's really just intended to give these commits unique identifiers. On the other hand, uh, it is often used in a sort of security capacity in order to make sure nobody has tampered with a Git repository. Now, the problem, of course, isn't exactly new, and the Git developers have looked into alternatives for quite a while now. The problem is that, of course, existing repositories have to be converted and the like, but it looks like they will now standardize on SHA-3. Now, SHA-3 still fairly new, but it is the most current standard, and given all the problems involved in upgrading the hashing algorithm, them, it probably makes sense that they're going with the latest and greatest. 
And Richard wrote a quick diary checking on what people are doing for intercepting and inspecting outbound traffic. Of course, there's always a risk of data leakage and command and control channels and the like. And uh, with more and more traffic being encrypted, some kind of man in middle or proxy solution is, of course, what many people are choosing. Even if you don't have a network-wide TLS proxy, many antivirus tools do install a proxy on the system itself. And we have seen in the past where this causes, for example, confusion with same origin policy or just a confusion about SSL certificates where the proxy is not as stringent in validating certificates as the host would be. US CERT actually just came out with an advisory regarding this, a reminder users to be careful in implementing TLS proxies in order to not downgrade TLS as part of that process. Once you do have a proxy in play, then of course the maximum TLS strength that you may achieve is limited by the proxy and not typically by the end user. Well, that's it for now. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.